All right. I can see people coming in and just want to say, well, I can see that people are coming in. Um, cannot see people's uh, video or see audio. That's the way that uh, we have this webinar set up. So I just want to welcome everybody. Thanks for being here with us today for the Zoom webinar, Parenting in Uncertain Times, Issues and Strategies for Parents of School-Aid Children. This is being held by the Youth and Family Services Department. You can see our contact information um, down at the bottom of the screen if anybody needs to email with any uh, questions or issues during this time or any time. And I'll just tell you a little bit about what's going on if some people are new to the Zoom webinar. So some things um, that you can see, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. It's two little talking bubbles and Q&A. This is the way that you're gonna be able to communicate with us throughout the webinar. So we won't be able to hear you and we won't be able to see you. Um, only the presenters will be able to be seen and heard, but you can communicate with us through that Q&A uh, section. And um, we, no one else besides the people leading this, the panelists, will be able to see that you're asking a question, but if you'd still prefer to be anonymous, there's an option there when you are going to do Q&A where you can choose to ask anonymously, and then even we wouldn't be able to see who was doing the asking. And we're going to be having a Q&A period um, in the latter half of this one-hour presentation, mm -hmm. so any questions that you have um, will be answered at that time. All right. I think we're going to start off um, here now that I see a, a good amount of people have joined us with some staff introductions, the people that you'll be hearing from today. And then I can tell you a little bit about the Youth and Family Services Department, our programs and services, and then we'll get going with the presentation. All right, so I can start off. My name is Danielle Sutton. I am a clinical social worker and also the director of the town's Youth and Family Services Department. Hi there, my name is Dara Baroud. I am the clinical coordinator for Westwood Youth and Family Services. And hi everybody, my name is Emily Greco and I'm the youth services counselor for Westwood Youth and Family Services. Great. Thanks everybody. All right, so the Youth and Family Services Department, for those of you who are joining us and might not uh, know about us, I wanted to just give a little bit of information. So Youth and Family Services is a municipal department. We have been here as one of Westwood's human services departments since uh, 1986 was when we were founded. And our mission is to support the healthy development of children and families. We do that through a variety of programming for children four to 18 years old and their families. So that looks like free individual and family counseling for children and families, um, parent consultation for parents of children between four and 18, free social skills groups where um, we call them structured play groups where kids in K through five can uh, join and practice their social skill development. We have girls groups for the fourth through sixth grade um, girl crowd. We have mentor programs that connect high school aged residents as volunteers with younger uh, residents in town. And they do that with some programs that connect them uh, directly, like our Friends Network program for third through fifth graders, as well as community education programs like Body Safety Theater. Anybody who's had a third grader knows about Body Safety Theater or Bullying Prevention Theater for the middle school crowd uh, for sixth graders where high schoolers come and perform skits that uh, teach some important skills there. So those are the things that we're doing in town to support that mission and the healthy development of Westwood families. And Okay, I'm just taking a look at our attendees. So um, I'm going to talk once more about kind of Zoom webinar in general uh, and things that you can expect um, as a participant, and then we'll move right in. So, all right, for people who are joining us and wouldn't have heard earlier, uh, this program is going to be from 12 to 1, and we're going to spend the first 
30 minutes uh, talking about the questions um, and issues that came through on the registration that everybody completed. So we've uh, categorized those, we've seen the major themes, and we're going to be able to address those um, questions with our responses in the beginning half. And then in the latter half, we're going to move um, with about 20 minutes left. Uh, so about 20 of one, we're going to move into a live Q&A where people can ask their questions. Um, and then we will wrap up right before one o'clock. So the, um, for those people who are participating, some things for you to know about Zoom, this is all new to us too. But uh, if you look down, so some of you might be in the same boat, if you look down at the bottom of your screen and you can hover there, there is a Q&A icon. This is what you would click on in order to ask us a question. And you can ask that question anytime. We'll be addressing questions during the Q&A period in the last 20 minutes. Um, and we will be answering those out loud. But you can write uh, your questions into the Q&A and we'll be able to see them. If you are joining us uh, and you didn't hear this before, we can't see you or hear you. So your audio and your video are not um, visible to anybody who's participating, but we as the panelists can see the questions that you would write and other attendees cannot see those questions. Uh, if you would prefer, even though only the panelists are seeing you ask the question, if you would prefer to be anonymous, you can select that option when you click on Q&A. All right, I'm just looking to make sure that I've covered everything. Sarah and Emily, feel free to jump in if I've missed anything, but I think we're ready to get started. Great. Okay. So I saw that agenda up uh, briefly. When we were, when we collected the registrations and we we're at full capacity with 100 participants, so we were glad to see that turnout and glad to be able to gather all of those parent questions ahead of time. And we saw four major themes among the questions that were submitted by parents through that registration. And those themes were themes around structure and routine, questions and issues there, uh, questions and issues around social connections, school life, and also mental health and some different aspects of mental health. So that's what we're going to be addressing today. And we'll be taking turns um, kind of tackling each of those and making sure that we're answering um, the bulk of questions by uh, doing that. All right, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the first uh, staff member who's going to be talking, Emily. Great, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, so just as a reminder, my name is Emily Greco, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about structure and routine and how that can work during this time from being at home. Um, so many of the questions that some families submitted to us were focused on how to structure their child's day, both during and after school. So outside of the structured learning time given by schools, there are ways that you can organize your family's schedules either on a daily or weekly basis. And when doing this, it's really important to keep in mind your individual child's and families and family's needs when creating a schedule. So for example, if flexibility is something that's really important for you, then creating a schedule with more room in it that allows for changes might work a little bit better. If tight planning and structure is preferred, then it might work well to plan out hourly chunks of the day. For older kids or kids who might need a little bit less structure, this might be as simple as just having a conversation about daily routines and goals or what is to be accomplished each day or throughout the week. For younger kids or kids who might need a little bit more structure, that can look like creating visual schedules for each day or for each week that are sectioned into different categories. And we've heard from a lot of families about really creative ways that people have been creating these schedules. So we're gonna be sharing a few of those ideas here. So this can look like just writing a schedule out simply on a piece of paper, on a whiteboard, on a chalkboard in the kids' room um, that has the general outline for the day. And the way you can do scheduling varies from household to household. So it can be done on an hourly basis. So for example, hours can be planned kind of from the time that kids wake up to the time that they go to sleep, or it can be based on having different chunks throughout the day. So you could schedule your morning time, your lunch time, afternoon time, evening time, and so on. And different examples of categories that can be included on your schedule include things like what happens during that morning wake up routine, whatever classes are going to be attended throughout the school day. Um, it can include additional reading time, for example, math time, computer time, some creativity or choice time. You can really be pretty creative with the different categories that you include in your child's schedules. 
And then we also recommend that it include things like different breaks throughout the day. So this might look like including a lunchtime on the schedule, some movement breaks or some outside time. And for a lot of kids, knowing when to expect breaks can sometimes be very motivating and really help with uh, productivity. And then you also might include some end of day routines. So that can look like what to expect um, as the kids wind down for the day and get ready for bed, if there are any household chores to be done, any family time, or just bedtime routines in general. And again, we've heard some really wonderful ways uh, that families have gotten really creative with schedules. So um, one example that we heard about was a family created a laminated schedule that had different colorful squares that represented different parts of the days. And they actually made it with Velcro. So each part of the day was movable. And this can be a really nice way to start your day. Sometimes kids um, really look forward to starting the day off with knowing exactly what to expect from their day and having some choice involved in that with some parent guidance, of course, and giving them some of that choice um, will satisfy that need uh, for some control for the kids. And also having this type of scheduling can really kind of remind them of school, which might be a nice comforting thing to feel throughout this time of being home. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, when creating these schedules, there are just a couple things that we would urge families to keep in mind. Um, so one is that it can be really important to work collaboratively, collaboratively with your children and with your families when creating these schedules. And it's also um, important to make sure that in doing so, you're really including your, your child's own ideas about how that schedule will work, as long as it's reasonable and acceptable to the parents and, and guardians, of course. Giving choices when creating schedules can be really effective, as I've said, but again, at the same time, making sure that whatever choices are included, that the parents are okay with, with what the child chooses. And overall, we would just urge you to view this as an experiment. Um, give yourself room to tweak it as you go if something isn't quite working the way you intended. Um, have that conversation with the family about making adjustments as needed and kind of being on the same page about being okay with switching things around during the day if needed. We would also suggest that um, including time apart can be helpful in a schedule. In my household, we call this independent time. Um, so really just keeping in mind that most of us are really used to being away from each other for at least eight hours a day, whether that be due to school or work. So we're living through a very different time now than what we're used to. So having that independent time built in can be really helpful in, in keeping everyone feel, feeling like their day is feeling you know, productive and, and feeling good to everybody. Um, and we also recommend that adults schedule themselves too, if that's something that feels helpful. This can be a really nice opportunity to model for your children about what it looks like to follow routines and follow expectations and also making adjustments based on how the day is going. So scheduling in general can definitely add a nice sense of predictability and routine to your day, but we just want to point out that it's not always a perfect system, especially now when we're all being exposed to really unusual levels of stress and uncertainty. So it can be really helpful to schedule family meetings as a way to check in on how things are going with everybody. So this can be a nice time to talk about what's working, what's not working, and then maybe setting some goals to make some changes throughout the, throughout the following week, for example. And although schedules you know, do help in maintaining some normalcy and setting some usual expectations, um, during this time, it can also really be important to find more relaxed versions of those routines that we're used to having in place. And just remembering that we're all living through an unprecedented time right now, which unfortunately is including unusual levels of stress, uncertainty, and loss. So just how you might loosen structure or expectations if you had a loss in your family, for example, during this time, give yourself that same permission to make those adjustments, take pause, relax expectations, and really just lean on each other within your family in order to cope through um, these unusual times. So that wraps up our section on structure and routine. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, who will be talking about social connections. Thank you, everybody. Great, thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Again, my name is Sarah Baroud, and I'm the clinical coordinator here at Westwood Youth and Family Services. We're so happy you're with us. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about social connections. So of course, this is one of the areas that's been impacted in a major way um, during this pandemic, and we're all feeling it for sure. Um, and a few aspects came up when we're thinking about social connections. So 
First, just discussing rules and safety um, around social connections during the pandemic. We had a couple of questions related to that, how to set those rules and boundaries, especially when different families have different, um, you know, uh, expectations around that. Next will be screen time. Uh, that's a big one, how to uh, manage that at home for both adults and children. And then ideas and strategies about how to stay connected in different ways. So first, um, just one point about safety. Um, we had some really great questions, like I mentioned, about how to talk about this with your um, children, teenagers, especially. We heard from some families that um, they're hearing from their kids that other, you know, teenagers, kids in town, they're seeing them together, whether it's on social media or just out and about, and that just doesn't feel fair. So how to handle that when it comes up in your home. Um, and we like to use the analogy of something a little bit more simple. So taking it out of this pandemic situation and just thinking about how we would talk about a seatbelt or a bike helmet. So if you, if your child came home and said, you know, I saw so-and-so, they weren't wearing their helmet and they were riding their bike. I don't think we would contemplate loosening our rules at home about whether or not we should, you know, encourage our children to wear a bike helmet. We would still say, you know, in our family, these are the expectations and it's our job to keep you safe as parents. So we understand it's really hard to see other kids doing different things, but we want to keep you safe. And these are the rules right now. So we would encourage you to follow that same um, guideline with um, social distancing and staying safe. You know, we're supportive of the CDC, of the governor, um, and are encouraging folks to follow those same rules. But we understand it's really hard when different rules uh, exist in different homes. So just an idea about how to handle that. Next, uh, screen time. So this is a big one, even not during a pandemic. Um, so just acknowledge and be transparent with your family, with your children, that this is an unusual time. And we all, adults included, are leaning on uh, our screens a lot more for learning, for work, for social connections. I mean, that's how we're talking with you guys now. It's just a necessary tool um, in our lives right now, more so than ever. So just be open with that with your kids. You know, this is different. And usually we only allow this. But right now we're being a little bit more relaxed about it because we want you guys to have um, fun talking to your family, fun talking to your friends. So just be open about that. It doesn't mean this is going to be the rules forever or it's going to be this loose forever. Um, but right now this is kind of what we're experiencing. And we know just as well as you know that social media is a very real tool for connection for us, for our children. And we wouldn't want to take that away. You know, it would be, um, it wouldn't be great if it was taken away from us. Um, and it would not feel great if it was taken away from our kids. So, um, but what we can do is just help them be aware of how they're using it. So, um, you know, again, we're all using it a lot more these days, but let's just pay attention to maybe how long we're using it. If we're not taking breaks from it, if we're not um, remembering to go to the bathroom, if we're not remembering to go have a snack, um, if we're noticing that it's impacting our children's mood, maybe, you know, like I've noticed you're on your phone for about two hours. Let's have a conversation about something. Let's go check the mail. Um, let's have a snack, something like that. So just kind of bringing an awareness of what social media is doing right now. So for better or worse, we're using it more. How is it impacting all of us? Um, and, you know, with that, just don't forget that you're the best role model for your children. So if you have some really great ideas about how you are keeping in touch with your friends and family, um, share them. Maybe those are things that you can, you know, make an age appropriate way for your children. And in the same um, thought, if it's impacting you in a negative way, your kids are probably struggling in the same way. So if you're on social media for too long and you're noticing like, whoa, I didn't know an hour went by, your kids are probably experiencing the same. So just keep in mind, you're a really good role model for your children as we always are. Um, but this goes, you know, more, more so now as we're together all the time. And then the next part about social connections is ideas and strategies to stay connected. So we had a lot of amazing ideas from you all, and we'll share a lot of those parent strategies at the end of the discussion. Um, and we also have some of our own. So we are happy to share this out at the end as well, some, some strategies here to stay connected. So kind of three categories, technology, the outdoors, and then educational. 
So first, technology. I'm sure you guys have heard about the House Party app, and if not, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, all social media has pros and cons, of course, and we need to use them safely. Um, but House Party is an app that's kind of like this. It would look similar to this, but it has some games built in, which is pretty neat. So while you're having a conversation, you can play games in real time. Um, also, the Wor Words with Friends app, uh, we all played that a couple of years ago, um, but there's other ones similar to that where you can play with people that you know um, and kind of have a friendly, semi-educational uh, competition um, with, with words. And then um, the TikTok app is another one, of course, that's really popular right now. Um, and, you know, again, we encourage you and your children to use these safely, but you can have a lot of fun creating dance videos and um, things like that. Also, uh, age-appropriate video games. Um, if you already have them in your house, you know that they're increasingly social. You know, you can have conversations with friends while you're in the video games. Some can be educational for sure. Um, so that's that's another thing to think about, that that is definitely a way that um, children are connecting with each other socially. And then uh, using Zoom and using Google Hangout, for example, there's a lot of things that you can do using those as the platform. So some examples were online board games. Um, Legos, card games, Pictionary, categories. So this would look like you um, or your children playing these games in your home and then setting up Zoom so that another family or another friend are playing the same game in their home and you're just interacting through the screen. Um, and one of my favorites is charades. So that would be a really fun one uh, to do from a distance. You can even um, encourage your kids to maybe give a tour of their bedroom or their um, house or yard in a fun way, pretend they're on like a reality show. Even if a friend has already seen their house, um, maybe they found something in their yard that was cool or you know a new thing in their room, maybe make a little video or take them around. Um, also using Zoom for book clubs, game nights, trivia nights, things like that. Then um, thinking about the outdoors, so getting outside the house, which we all know that we need to do sometimes, um, still using technology for a lot of these things. This is how we how we connect right now, but um, some of these, thankfully, we don't have to. So uh, hikes and bike rides are a great idea from a safe distance if your family um, feels good about that. We know that getting outside is really great for mental health and physical health. Um, another wonderful idea is a traveling lawn gnome or a traveling stuffed animal. You could use almost anything. Just something fun and silly that um, travels from one yard to the next, you know, kind of maybe overnight or in the morning, you know, passing it along kind of secretly and documenting where the stuffed animal is traveling. So that's something that you can take pictures of, share pictures, um, leave messages, you know, maybe in someone's mailbox or on their door um, to get excited about the traveling um, stuffed animal. And then um, friendly competitions, you know, maybe you want to compete with family or friends about how far you've run in one week or how many push-ups you could do or uh, how many free throws you can do. So documenting those and then um, competing, you know, in a healthy way. And finally, educational. So some educational ideas of how to connect uh, and stay connected. So we heard um, about this one from you all, which was great. So researching um, some topics that your children might be interested in. Um, one example I think someone shared was maybe getting a new pet. So what does it take to bring a new pet into your house? Um, there's a lot and a lot more than your children probably are thinking about. So um, everyone can research it within your house. Maybe your friends are thinking about getting a goldfish too. Who can find out more about getting a new goldfish, you know, and um, which who, who feels more prepared, you know, that kind of thing. So engaging other families or other, you know, your children and other children with research is kind of cool. Um, and finally, one of my favorites is writing letters. So um, pen pals, this is there's no better time, um, you know, whether it's peer to peer or children to grandparents or family members. Um, it can be really exciting to send mail and to get creative and of course, really exciting to receive mail. Um, and really, I think a nice thing is to learn about the postal service, um, you know, especially for younger kids. These people are doing great work right now. They always do. And um, they're helping, you know, bring us exciting things in the mail. So how does it work? What does a stamp do? That kind of thing. Um, good time to learn that. So a lot of great ideas from you all and from us uh, about how to stay socially connected in this physical, physically distant time. 
and we can share those after the event. So I'm going to turn it back over to Emily to talk a little bit more about school. Thank you, Sarah. Um, So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about school life, which is something that um, every family with kids is dealing with right now, in addition to possibly working from home. Um, So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, feelings around distance learning in general, how to handle homework and optional assignments, and then also how to think about that outside of school time. Um, Sarah already gave us some amazing ideas for Um, for some other activities that parents can be thinking about uh, with their kids. And we've also heard a lot of um, requests for some educational activities too. So we'll go through some of those in addition to sending them out in the resources. And just one quick note, we did also receive a number of questions that were uh, specific to school and things related to curriculum and IEPs, for example. Um, And just as a reminder, as Danielle mentioned, we are a municipal department, and although we work very closely with the schools, um, we're not part of the school district as a whole. So if you you do have any school-specific questions, we have spoken with Westwood Public Schools and understand that any specific questions like that could be directed to your school principal or your your in-building special education administrator. And we also understand that a letter went out this past Friday to all parents and guardians of children with IEPs. So many of your questions might actually be answered in that letter as well. We've heard that principals are holding virtual coffees. So this might be another opportunity for you to connect with your building principals and get your questions answered that way. Um, But some of the questions that we received about school related issues, we are going to tackle here. So um, hopefully we can answer some of those questions that you have. So remote learning um, has been a very new experience for many of our kids. So again, we've received a lot of questions around how to best support them through this this new experience that they're dealing with. And we've heard that some kids are really enjoying this new way of learning and um, this new practice may come very naturally to a lot of them. But on the other hand, um, we've heard that a lot of kids are feeling a little bit more resistant to the remote learning in general. So if this is the case, we would suggest first finding out where this resistance might be coming from. And this might take a little bit of digging on your part as the parent or guardian. And we would suggest asking or thinking about questions like, is this resistance something that you're seeing all the time with school? Um, Were they showing any resistance to schoolwork before this distance learning began? Um, Are you noticing any feelings uh, related to them possibly feeling down or anxious or stressed? Um, these are just some important things to think to think about if you are noticing some resistance when it comes to tackling the school day or schoolwork or homework. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that if you're seeing any resistance, it could possibly be related to their feelings around this new normal of distance learning with. And if so, it's really important, as we've talked about before, to give kids space to talk about it, express their feelings around it. Um, and just their feelings about what it's like to be learning from home and, and really as parents and guardians, just kind of normalizing those feelings. Um, a lot of us are working remotely at this time and that's a new experience for us and we all have very different ways of dealing with it. And a lot of kids are going through something similar with um, their distance learning. And a, a huge piece of it also may be that they're simply missing their friends and getting to see kids every day or missing their teachers that they get to see every day that they may have really strong connections with. So these are all just important aspects of the distance learning to keep in mind when you're, if you're seeing any resistance um, to the distance learning process. And then also thinking back to the scheduling that we talked about, um, thinking about if there are ways to make adjustments to the routine that might feel a little bit more doable for your child. And again, um, we would emphasize collaborating as a family to make any changes um, that might need to be made to the scheduling. So we also know that many children are now faced with some optional assignments and some families a little bit with how to handle that or manage that um, as a family. So one thing that we would suggest is to think about the reasons that you would have your children uh, participate in these optional assignments. So for example, if it's making kids feel productive and engaged, then we would say go for it. Um, But on the other hand, if it is introducing a little too much stress and and uncertainty, then this might be a good time to introduce some more flexibility and loosen those expectations a little bit, especially if they're considered optional assignments. 
And we know that some elementary families um, are receiving checklists that, that include some of those optional items. So this might feel a little overwhelming for some kids to see a pretty significant list of optional items to tackle. So this um, could be a nice chance for you as a family or as a team to rewrite this checklist and only include items that were agreed upon in advance. So the child is only looking at exactly what needs to be done each day or each week. For some older students, for example, um, completing that optional work might feel a little bit more necessary at this time. So we would suggest supporting your child and kind of thinking ahead to next year, which we realize can be, might feel a little daunting, um, but helping them to see that completing some of these assignments now might prepare them for the rigors of, um, of the next school year to come, and that it might help to even select just one or two optional assignments to complete each week to lighten the load just a little bit. And we would also suggest choosing optional assignments from a variety of subjects, that way they're introduced to some novelty and to help them feel a little bit more well-rounded in terms of completing work for each of the classes that they're enrolled in. So we also know that homework in general um, can be quite a source of stress, anxiety, and frustration, especially during this time of remote learning. Um, so one thing that we would say is that when it comes to homework load, it could be really helpful to break, um, break down the expectations into smaller, um, less anxiety-provoking chunks. So instead of having to think about all the homework that a child needs to complete for the whole week, going day by day, breaking it down by assignments or even into smaller pieces within the assignment might feel a little bit more doable. And if it's acceptable to parents and guardians, prioritizing work and deciding if certain assignments or parts of assignments can be let go, um, again, if that's, if that's feeling doable within the family and in order to meet the school expectations, um, bringing that flexibility in can be helpful in this, kinds of in this kind of situation with homework. And then some students we know, like middle schoolers, for example, um, might be given assignments on a weekly basis. So this might, again, introduce some feelings of being overwhelmed looking at the entire weekly schedule of assignments or homework. So again, breaking down those weekly assignments into five-day schedules in advance might, make, uh, might help to make that load feel a little bit more bearable for kids. So what about when the school day is all done and homework is all completed? Um, a lot of families are left uh, with multiple unscheduled hours a day and are looking for some educational activities to extend their child's learning and introduce some creativity. So again, Sarah already shared um, a bunch of wonderful activity ideas, many of which came from you all, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna go through and share a few other ideas. And again, these will be shared out in the parent-to-parent -parent strategies that we share with you later on. So there are some organizations that are actually hosting virtual museum and zoo tours. So that can be a nice, different, fun way of engaging kids virtually. Um, as Sarah already suggested, encouraging kids to research different topics that they're interested in and then being able to come back to the family and, and teach the family about what they learned could be a nice educational uh, way of engaging kids beyond the typical school hours and it is also a nice way to engage the whole family. You can also have your kids or family as a whole design a menu for meals for the week ahead, um, whether it's you know, a menu for one day or for dinners for the week, whatever you and your family choose, um, that can really promote some excitement and um, some nice family connections over cooking and, and planning out meals for the week. And again, as Sarah mentioned, you know, keeping social distancing practices in mind, um, hikes and nature exploration is always a great way to get outside and, and get kids' bodies moving, and for adults as well, of course. Um, another idea is to watch documentaries. There are a lot of wonderful documentaries out right now, um, many of which are child-friendly. There are some wonderful movies or books and articles on different topics of interest that we would recommend watching, um, many of which are related to topics that can be covered in class, so that might be a nice way to keep kids connected back to what they're learning in class. And there are also many magazine subscriptions that can be a really nice way to keep kids busy. So a few, uh, for example, are National Geographic for Kids, Cobblestone, Sports, uh, Sports Illustrated for Kids. They all have both paper and digital subscriptions available. So that's another idea um, for something educational. There's also a website called Common Sense Media that outlines a lot of thoughts and ideas about managing uh, media and social media in general, but it also includes a list of family <coughs> movies that are broken down by age and by topic. So that might be another 
a nice resource for exploring different movies that kids can watch either on their own or, or with the family. There's also a website called Big Life Journal, and they actually have a PDF, um, which we can likely send out as well, of a list of different activities that kids can do to keep busy. So, you know, we're hearing again, all these wonderful ideas from different parents, um, but sometimes it can be hard to just come up with things on the spot. So this just has a concrete list of different things that you can do, and they're organized by category. So there are things, there are different categories for young kids, teens, um, indoor activities, outdoor activities, things that kids can do by themselves, things they could do uh, virtually or with the whole family. So it really has a nice concrete list and um, is a great resource just when coming up with different ideas for activities to do. Um, and then like we said, we will also encourage you to check out the parent to parent strategies that we'll be sending out because um, you know, relying on each other for strategies and ideas is a great way to be coming up with um, different and new ways to be bringing fun and creative activities into your household. And just, you know, on a closing note, I would just say that, you know, sometimes kids might need some encouragement, especially during this time, um, to try some new activities or stay busy, but they also may have some really creative and fun ideas themselves in order to keep themselves in different ways to keep themselves busy. So when possible, we would just say to follow their lead when planning fun and educational activities because um, they likely have some wonderful ideas that may surprise you. So again, um, checking in with your kids about what ideas they might have for something fun that you can do as a family or something fun that they can do on their own um, would be a nice way to get their input and give them a sense of control when they're planning out their day. So thank you very much for listening. I am going to pass this back over to Danielle and she's gonna be discussing mental health. Take it away, Danielle. All right, thank you, Emily. And um, I know that this is a lot of talking for those of you who are attendees. So I hope you have your, your notebooks and your pens and pencils going. And as both ladies have mentioned before me, we're gonna be sending out a list of these resources and some other things, uh, hopefully even a recording of this event to everybody who registered so that you'll have a chance to go through it again. Um, and also you'll have a chance to see those resources up close. Um, and personal. So I'm going to be talking about our last um, theme, and that is the theme of mental health. And when we looked at the questions and issues that parents um, had submitted this on this theme, it fell into a few different categories, and those were anxiety, grief and loss, and general mental health. So I'm going to start with anxiety and then talk a little bit about grief and loss and then go into general mental health and supports um, at the uh, end. And then we'll be moving into our Q&A session. So starting with anxiety, we parents were worried about children and teens anxiety in the face of everything that's been going on with COVID-19, all the changes that they've had to deal with in their daily lives. And something that feels really important to acknowledge and say out loud is that it's really appropriate and normal that everyone would be experiencing higher than usual anxiety. And that is the normal response of a healthy brain. And, um, sorry. Uh, I just lost audio for a second. Thanks for bearing with me. Can I get a thumbs up from uh, my panelists? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So we, um, so understanding that anxiety is a normal response of a healthy brain in these circumstances that we're facing. So anxiety is considered a mental health issue or concern when it's not situationally appropriate. So there isn't anything going on that would be considered anxiety provoking or the anxiety is at a level that doesn't match the stressor. So having panic-like symptoms um, in the face of a minor math quiz would be a time when um, that is you know, not considered appropriate to the situation. Given that we're in a public health crisis and given all of the changes, it makes sense that we would be seeing higher than usual anxiety or some more anxiety symptoms in ourselves and in our children and teens. Parents also wondered um, how would they know if their children were anxious and it was manifesting itself indirectly. So some things you might notice as a parent would be irritability, irritability that's uh, more than usual uh, and that is sustained uh, over a longer period of time, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep that's different than before, uh, 
clinginess that has changed a child's ability to do things independently that they did independently before. Um, those things might be present. And again, just recognizing that this would be situa situationally appropriate at this time. So what we'd recommend is, you know, talking about anxiety symptoms, monitoring what you're seeing, and, and then if it feels like it's not receding over time or it's reaching heights that don't seem appropriate to the situation, then you might want to seek out more intervention around that. Some steps that parents can take uh, to help manage anxiety would be to identify it, normalize it as something that makes sense given what's going on, and take a strengths-based approach by identifying what children and teens and what adults themselves are doing well, where they're demonstrating their coping skills, um, brainstorm other coping strategies like writing down your worries and putting them in a box or a notebook and then discussing them at a certain time of day, like the early evening, so that you're taking those worries and instead of letting them percolate all day, you're saying, all right, I'm having this thought, I'm having this worry, I'm writing it down, we're going to address it later. So kind of finding ways to compartmentalize that can be a healthy uh, coping skill that you might introduce. Limiting access to news and um, discussing and allowing visits to reputable websites and social media sources. Modeling healthy coping skills yourself. And of course, uh, what's been mentioned in all the sections already, um, exercise and moving those bodies. All right, just checking microphone again and moving on to the next section. So grief and loss is something that is present in what's going on for sure, but it might not be what our mind goes to. So we think about anxiety, we think about feeling anxious, we attribute things that are happening to us as anxiety in this situation, but we might not be thinking about grief and loss um, in this way when we are losing aspects of our daily life. So one thing that parents wondered about was how to help kids accept the changes that they've had, how to accept uh, celebrating milestones differently, how to, you know, not be so upset about not being able to be with friends. And we think that the first uh, thing we would recommend is to understand and acknowledge that these are losses for all of us um, and that we're all experiencing grief for the loss of normalcy, the loss of freedoms, the loss of what we expected our lives to look like um, at this you know, time of the year or at this point in our life. There was a great article in the Harvard Business Review. It was called That Feeling You're Feeling is Grief. And we've included it in our resource section to email out. They did a really nice job of talking about the different stages of grief and how people move through them differently and what they might look like under these circumstances. And so with grief and loss or any adjustment to major change, it takes time and it can't be rushed. So we, we all want to get to a place of acceptance and kind of feeling better about things. And we want that for the people we love too but it's not something that can be rushed. It's normal to move back and forth from feelings of acceptance, uh, feelings of normalcy, and also to, um, you know, to move back and forth between those feelings like, okay, this is happening, this is real, and feeling like it's not real or forgetting uh, and kind of remembering all of a sudden that it is really happening. And so it's important to know those things. Um, and also, when it comes to the idea of celebrating milestones differently, it's important to get someone's input ahead of time, whether they're a child or a teen or another adult. You want to get their input on how they might want to celebrate under these new circumstances. Because again, everybody grieves differently and everybody's way of managing this new reality is going to be different. So you want to get a sense of how they would like to celebrate um, or if they want to celebrate um, certain things in this situation. All right, I'm going to move into talking about some general mental health, and then we are going to move to Q&A. So parents also asked about how to support mental health in general and how to support resilience in their children during this time. And what we know is that people who cope well or cope successfully, uh, who adapt successfully in extraordinarily difficult situations, they do that with by demonstrating an ability to bring their focus to what's happening in the now, to bring it to the actions that they can take on a day-to-day -day basis in small ways. And then that leads to a, a gradual and a larger adap adaption or adaptation uh, and larger change. So taking it bit by bit um, and focusing on what you can control and what you can uh, manage in a given moment or in a given hour or in a given day, bringing it back down to that. It's uh, also good to check in and ask your child how they feel like they're coping, 
Um, hearing from a, we're hearing from a number of school-age children and adolescents who report coping really well despite the losses um, and the changes in their life. Here's a couple ways that you can check in with kids of different ages. Um, sorry. Okay. Can you guys hear me all right? All right, great. So <clears throat> ways that you can check in with kids of different ages to see how they're doing with their mental health in general. Um, it's somebody had asked about, you know, how to get a middle schooler to kind of talk about that, or a couple of people had asked how to get a middle schooler or a high schooler uh, to talk about how they're feeling when they don't want to. And one thing that we use in counseling and that um, it was actually brought up in a, a webinar from our friend, uh, John Madelman last week in his uh, teens, tweens, and quarantine webinar, but the idea of using a scale. So a simple one to 10 scale where one is, you know, the worst I've ever felt and 10 is the best I've ever felt in terms of my mood um, or my mental health. You can just say, hey, on a scale of one to 10, with those two things being the ends of the scale, you know, where, where are you at? And that gives you some nice language and a quick way to check in about how somebody's doing without having to have a whole conversation about it. So that can really work. If it feels appropriate, um, somebody says, you know, I'm at a seven. If it feels like, okay, this is a good time to have a bit more of a conversation, you might say, oh, okay, you know, I remember that you were at a six yesterday and, you know, what bumped you up to a seven? Or, you know, what if you're at a seven today? What would it take, you know, to move to a seven and a half or eight? You know, what, what might we be able to do there? You're, so you can have a little bit more conversation around it, but you can also keep it short and sweet. Um, for elementary or early middle school clients, you might even use an emoji check check in. Um, that can be something that's fun and easy. They could even add their own drawing or create an emoji to describe how they're feeling. And that's another way of gauging where they're at, but without kind of having the, the dreaded, you know, sit down uh, conversation. People asked a lot about resiliency and how to support re resiliency um, and mental health. And so just some key points um, that we would make, prioritizing your physical and mental health is, you know, um, number one, noticing and praising the resilient and healthy behaviors that we see people using. So coming from that strengths-based perspective, like what are you already doing? What do I see you doing every day? Um, and noticing those little things, that helps to reinforce that we are coping, we are demonstrating resilience. And then of course, modeling it ourselves as adults. All right. Having conversations as a family, people have mentioned, you know, the family check-in or the family meeting. It can be for more formal like that, or it can just be a quick conversation about how you guys are coping and how you've coped in the past with difficult things. Everyone has experienced challenges in their family. They might be different challenges, but it's a time to highlight how you cope and how people have done a good job at that and how they've shown resilience in the face of challenges in the past. Acknowledging and uh, understanding the stages of grief, we talked about that, and say, letting people know that it's okay to grieve the losses in their life and that everyone grieves differently. Normalizing with, your, with adults and with kids that some anxiety and depression symptoms are to be expected in times like this, and it's a normal reaction of a healthy brain um, and intervention is not necess necessary, necessarily necessary. Um, last, uh, in just our, my last minute here, I'll say some mi any mindfulness activities are going to be helpful in times like this. They reduce stress, they reduce symptoms of anxiety, they reduce symptoms of depression. So any mindfulness activities that you can think of, it could be something as simple as mindful eating, where you really pay attention to something uh, that you're putting into your mouth. My a mindful nature walk, uh, a chalk labyrinth that you make on your driveway or you make in your backyard with stones and then actually walking that labyrinth, um, prayer, meditation, journaling. Uh, I saw a great thing the other day about someone who created a journal of delights where they would write things like, you know, a good cup of coffee or warm socks on a winter day, things that they were experiencing that day that brought them delight. And I thought that was a great, um, you know, play off of a gratitude journal and a fun thing to do in a time like this when things uh, might be a little bit more closed and simple in our lives in terms of being, uh, you know, in, in our homes, in, in our, with our family. Calm or Headspace or other mindfulness apps are good things uh, to use in aiding meditation and mindfulness. 
And then if it feels appropriate or necessary, counseling is still available. So we are providing in our department uh, counseling via telehealth. So we do that through video uh, and through phone. And so are most other mental health providers. So that is definitely something that people can do as an individual or as a family. And there are many, many virtual support groups that are also happening. So to that aim, I'll talk about two resources. Um, specifically about that, and then we'll move into Q&A. So the Interface Referral Service is available to all Westwood residents, and they confidentially match, um, and it is a free service, they confidentially match people with the services that they're looking for for mental health support. And so you simply give them a call. They're working their usual nine to five, Monday through Friday, the William James College Interface Referral Service, and we'll send that out with our resource links. You give them a call, you tell them what you're looking for and your insurance and all of your needs, and they're gonna match you with someone who's providing immediate telehealth counseling um, to serve the needs that you have. And then we're always happy to hear from you. So we are here and open to the idea of providing, um, you know, evolving supports during this time. Um, and we'd love to hear from people about what their needs are, whether it's parent support groups or individual or family counseling or parent consultation of some kind. All right. So knowing that we're coming up um, in our last 10 minutes of this, I'm looking uh, at our Q&A and thinking we'll move into that section and then uh, wrap up. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much, Danielle. So I'm going to be reading off a few questions. Um, this is a good time to hit that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions that you might have, and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, one quick note, someone commented um, that I would like to share. Someone commented that the Westwood CPAC, so the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, um, has support groups every other Tuesday. So thank you for noting that. And we will include the CPAC link in our resources guide um, that we send you via email. So thank you for that. Um, so one question that we have been receiving from quite a few people is that uh, families are noticing changes in sleep routines, especially during this time. Um, so one question is, what suggestions do you have for tackling this at home? Okay, that's a great yeah. question. I can go first and Sarah, you can jump in. Yeah. All right. So yeah, sleep has definitely come up. Uh, we've heard that um, from a number of people. And so ways to address sleep issues, you know, we've heard about people having trouble falling asleep. We've heard about people um, having trouble staying asleep. We've also heard, you know, uh, kind of about changes in the hours of sleep. So what we can, what we would talk about um, or do think about when it comes to sleep is, you know, Considering one thing that can be really important with helping to fall asleep is, well, let me back up and just say, I think that this is another thing where that would be somewhat normal consider, considering what we're going through. So that can, that idea of having troubled sleep isn't something that, it's something that we're hearing about because it's something that uh, makes sense to be experiencing during this time. So understanding that this is part of a normal response um, of a healthy brain to extraordinary circumstances. Some things you can do to support sleep um, are to consider your sleep routine. So everybody has things that they do right before bed, and that lets our body know that we are getting ready to fall asleep. And especially for kids, this is important um, and part of good sleep hygiene. Well, those routines may have changed now that we are in totally different circumstances. So, you know, a teenager may have taken a shower every night before bed um, because they were preparing to go to school the next day. Well, now that they're just home, maybe that's gone to every cu couple days or every few days. That might be a change in the routine that is their body's trying to adjust to or um, that might make it more difficult for them to fall asleep. So you don't have to necessarily go back to all of your your routines before COVID-19, but you can think about, oh, maybe that's what's going on and think about what your new routine is or maybe adding back in some of those aspects if it turns out that they were really helpful. So thinking about your sleep routine would be one thing. You want to jump in, Sarah? Yeah, I think this is an area where a routine, like Danielle is saying, is really important. Emily talked about routine early on and how it's okay to loosen things right now. But um, when it comes to sleep, we still need those cues. We still need to know, our body needs to know when that is going to um, start, when it's going to take place. I've definitely heard this from some teenagers that um, they're going to bed much later. And we do know that the you know teenage body, it you know they might get sleepy a bit later than um 
you know, 8, 9 p.m. It can be later than that. And maybe waking a little later is okay too. So that could be an okay um, an okay change that could happen right now. Um, Danielle mentioned earlier um, about a notebook, you know, tracking things that are worrying you. Um, sometimes our bodies might feel real tired and ready to go to bed, but our minds just can't stop, especially in these times of stress and anxiety um, with some mental health challenges. So um, getting those out of your head, you know, whatever that looks like, um, put, writing them down in your phone, you know, getting that away, putting them in the note section um, or keeping a notebook next to your bed where you can write those things down, just get rid of them. Um, also practicing re relaxation strategies. So um, a great one is a progressive muscle relaxation. So this is, you know, not needing your phone, not needing anything, just when you're in bed, you're tightening and then releasing every muscle that you can in your body, starting from your toes all the way up to your forehead. So you're just for a few seconds, squeezing, wiggling, tightening your toes, and then letting them go. And then moving up to your ankles and your heels, wiggling them, squeezing them, letting them go. So that's one way to um, kind of just tell your body, okay, we're going to let all of this go. We're going to let the stress that we feel in our body go. So those techniques. And again, just realize that we're going through a lot right now. So it would be normal to have some disruption. Just try to stick with, with it, stick with yourself, stick with your kids and work on those routines. Thank you. All right. So I'm seeing that we have five minutes left, Danielle. Do we have time for another yep. question or? I think, um, let's see, why don't we why don't we try one question and then with about three minutes left, let's move into um, our staying connected um, slide and then we can send out any of the, we were just going to show a quick um, screenshot of the parent to parent strategies and then send them out via email along with the other resources. So we don't need to show that. We will just send it to everybody via email. And if you have any questions, you can let us know. So why don't we do one more question and then we'll wrap up. Great. So one question that we have here is what would you suggest doing for a teenager who has moved past the anxious and anger stage of grief and is now feeling sad and lethargic? Hmm. That's a great question. I can start, Danielle. Um, yeah. So Danielle referenced the stages of grief earlier. Um, what we know is that they're not linear. Um, we've learned a lot about grief over the years. And um, this, this is a great question. You know, so you've seen these different phases go through with your teenager. Right now, they're feeling sad and lethargic. Um, really sorry to hear that. They're certainly not alone. You're not alone either. Um, I would really encourage a lot of validation. So what they're feeling is real and it's okay and it's normal. Um, so validate, talk about it, let them know it's okay. Figure out how to still accomplish the basics while they're feeling this way. And just know that they're going to move through this too. You know, they could go back to um, acceptance. They could go back to anger. You know, we, we move through these stages, like I said, not in a linear way. And we don't typically get stuck in one of these stages either. So they tend to move even within one day. We can kind of have all these different feelings. If you do find that the teenager, your child is getting stuck and really is sad for, let's say, more than a week, two weeks, reach out, call us, call our department, call Interface to get them some help. Maybe this is something that's really impacting their functioning more than what would typically be expected. Mm -hmm. I think that's great, Sarah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I will now share, if you bear with me, I'm going to share our staying connected slide, which has some ways that you can stay connected to our department. So just give me one quick second. <laughs> Sure. And while you're sharing that, Emily, um, I will just thank everybody for being here with us today and, um, you know, being right along for the ride as we figure out Zoom webinar and um, work on our presentation skills. So thanks again for joining. Um, please feel free to reach out to us anytime. And please feel free to uh, follow us on social media where we'll be posting updated resources. Um, now that we've heard from parents and we know some of the big themes and topics that are on their mind, we're going to be putting our energy towards getting more of those resources up on social media. And we, um, 
also, you know, just want to hear from you with any questions that you might have. So after this, you can expect to receive an email um, for anybody who registered, including those who weren't able to be here with us live today. And that will include, um, hopefully, a recording of this event. Um, and then also the parent-to-parent -parent strategies that people shared on the registration forum. There were some really great things in there. You can see um, what your neighbors in the community are doing um, that are working for them. And links and resources to things that we mentioned, even some things that we didn't get to today. So thanks again for being with us. Thanks so much to the Youth and Family Services staff, Sarah and Emily, and also uh, behind the scenes, Mary Ellen, our administrative assistant who did so much of the work uh, getting this prepared. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to our audience. And we'll hope to stay in touch. Thank you, Danielle. Thank thanks, you everyone. Much. Bye.